Well, we begin the, the next session. I will call the moderator Jean-Paul Trahen. Hi, everyone. Um, I will just introduce the, the next session uh, about um, a very interesting uh, subject, which is uh, extreme beam and beam innovation. And when I, I was supposed to present, to introduce this uh, session, um, I was a little bit afraid about uh, what is extreme, extreme in beam. What is, uh, it is, it is uh, for uh, beam, uh, beam modeling, the complexity of the project, or is it, it is uh, the extreme uh, or innovation in terms of collaboration or in terms of management. And uh, the both presenter I will introduce now uh, will, uh, will have a, 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 a big, an extreme experience about these uh, three levels of BIM. Uh, just uh, two words about Aegis, which, which is uh, who I have uh, been the, the, the BIM director for uh, deploying BIM and uh, tools and methods inside the group uh, around the world, but especially for the uh, building um, uh, chapters of this, um, of this uh, company, big company. And uh, my expertise is used in the media construct to manage some uh, um, teams around uh, normalization of subject. Uh, for instance, the, a guide for BIM execution plan for France uh, I, I, I have taken uh, last year. So now I will introduce uh, Bimal Patwari, which is uh, the, the chief executive, please come, <laughs> of uh, Pinnacle. Uh, you probably uh, more detailed the, the, uh, the goals of this uh, big company, but uh, the, 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 the main topics you know, we, uh, we want to, to, to share with you is that uh, um, Bimal is uh, deploying BIM and extreme BIM and innovation on the field of the project. That's, that's correct? That's right. Okay. So change to the, your presentation. Thank you, Jean. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good Thank you. I'm very excited and delighted to be here. Uh, I must thank Mr. Ignasi, all the organizers, and all of you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. How many of you believe in destiny? How many of you, can you raise your hands? You don't believe in destiny? Okay. Look at my name. 50 years back, my parents named me after BIM. You know, Autodesk was not born, Bentley was not there, computers were not there, but they were so visionary. And today, my company, we specialize in this field, and, and I'm very excited to be here to share my experiences with you. Today, I'm going to talk about, as Jean said, that what are the challenges in construction industry? We are going through stress. And how can we address that stress? You know, yesterday there were a lot of speakers who were talking about the productivity improvement in construction industry. We are, they compared us with farming, like 1% improvement in productivity in so many decades. So what can we do to get ahead? We will talk about, in the limited time that I have, I would like to talk about some of the innovation, some of the new things that are happening in BIM uh, which are very exciting because we are working across the globe. So I'll try to share with you my experiences. We are currently executing BIM projects in more than 32 countries across all continents. So we have seen the best practices in different countries and I'd be very happy, you know, the whole theme of this summit is to share uh, the knowledge so all of us can learn from each other and benefit. We have done more than 4,500 BIM projects. So those of you who have any doubts about this technology, you can remove those doubts. BIM works. It works very well. And 
it is getting compulsory. You don't have an option. Nobody is now asking why BIM. We are only asking how BIM. OK, so this is our team. We have a global footprint. We have offices in different countries. We have got offices in India, in US, in London, Zurich, and Dubai. And we have been working in different countries. We have been delivering iconic projects. So most of our projects are more than 100,000 square meters. You know, so they are big projects, the tallest building in the world, the largest airports, the largest malls, the largest commercial projects. So we have been working on these projects. And I would like to share today some of my experiences in these projects. Now, I said construction industry is in stress. Why? And I'm sure all of you share my concerns. First of all, the designs are becoming very complex. The architects, they are designing more and more complex. If, if you go to Middle East, each of the buildings have twists. You know, they, 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 they take any kind of shape you want. You know, any pose. You know, yesterday we were seeing the flamingo dance. So probably, you know, they would design something like that. And we have to execute that. Today, any big project, you have global collaboration. You have the structural engineer from a country, MEP consultant from a different country, general contractor, fabrication, architect. Most of the projects that we do, and I've seen that in Spain especially, uh, most of the big construction companies, 80% of their projects are outside Spain. That's what I was told yesterday. So there's a big challenge to collaborate between different entities in a project. There are multiple services. If you see an airport, if you see a hospital, if you see a mall, there are so many trades today. You know, the security, AV, there are so many consultants. Uh, there are kitchen consultants, there are, uh, there are landscape consultants. So we need to coordinate all of these. Lesser ceiling space. The owners are becoming miser. They, they spend, want to spend less money. And the architects are able to give us less ceiling space. And we have to work within that ceiling space. So that's another challenge. We don't have the luxury of big ceilings so that you can put everything. Wastages. You know, my clients, they invite me to the various sites. And they say, look at the wastages. The industry standard is 10 to 15% wastages on site. And if you are making the wastage on site, it is a wastage. But if you if you same thing, if you do prefabrication, everything can be used. So there is no wastage on the side. So the choice is ours. Are you familiar with this photograph? So the way the traditional construction industry has been happening. So you build the block work, then you mark it, then you break it. This has to go. This is simply not acceptable anymore. You know, this is my favorite quote, and I think this is very appropriate for BIM. It's the great Abraham Lincoln who said, if I have six hours to cut a tree, I would use four hours to, ax my, uh, to uh, sharpen my ax. Same thing with construction industry. If we have 12 months to execute a project, please spend three months or four months to plan it. Before you start construction, everything must be virtually constructed. Everything must be value engineered. Sorry. Everything must be well coordinated so that if there are 20 contractors on site, each of them have, they know the XYZ coordinate. They can work independently. There is no rework. That is what we want to achieve in BIM. So I don't want to talk more about BIM. All of you know. So BIM is basically from concept design till facilities management. It's the entire project life cycle where you want to use the BIM. I want to show you a small video to show that how the whole Look at this stadium that we are doing now. 
in, in Doha, this stadium is just starting to build. But the whole planning, every day, what work will be done, where will be the site logistics, just look at this, how you're going to do your construction, everything is planned in this particular project. It's a huge uh, new stadium that is coming up for, uh, for the World Cup football in 2022 in Doha. This is the inaugural stadium. And look at the, the level of planning, the whole site logistics. I, I've reduced the total video because there's less number of time, but you see the cranes, how the cranes are going to be placed so that they don't obstruct each other. So all the site logistics also needs to be planned. So every small detail, and you can see the, the time here, the month progress. So every day, what work will be done? So if you stop it that, okay, on 15th August 2018, where will we be on the project? You can see from this planning. So this is the level of planning that we are talking about so that we have complete details about the project. And there is no way, you know, the time frame is so less for this project and you have so many stakeholders, we could, cannot complete this project unless we have this level of planning in our work. And the best part is for construction management, we get all my quantities. You want to know how much concrete is going to be used tomorrow, day after tomorrow, how much steel, how much of what will be the cash flow, how many workers will be required, how many machinery will be required. So you get all the details from this particular present, uh, this type of coordination. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to now talk about another project that we are doing. And as the topic suggests, that when you have such complex projects, what do you do from the normal BIM? What are the innovations you bring on? We are currently working on uh, the tallest building that is coming up in Jeddah. Uh, it is 1.1 kilometer tall now. It shows one, one kilometer. They keep increasing the, the tallest, uh, the height of the building, because they want to remain the tallest. They are almost 30% more than Dubai. This is going to use, the total area is 6 million square feet. There are 252 floors and four basements. There are 59 elevators in this project. And first time I'm going to see double-decker and triple-decker elevators. There is 105 meter, 30 floors inside the, the ground. So you can imagine the kind, kind of foundation that this building has. They've spent one third of the cost of the project just on the design and research and development. And this building at the top, it sways almost 10 feet, 2.6 meters on the top. It was just by the, the wind is so much. And you can imagine you have to do the construction. And if you want to take your pipe up, upstairs, up on that floor, you have no margin for error. It has to be like spacecraft. This is the pro progress. I keep going there. Uh, we have almost 100 people working on this project for last three years. We are doing the complete MEP design development and complete BIM coordination and shop drawings and facilities management for this project. I love to be there. I mean, the way this is going up. Let me show you a small video on this. Just see the, how this building is getting constructed.
we have already done the coordination till 100th level, and they're pouring at around 55th level now. And uh, it's slightly behind the schedule. Uh, they, it's going to take another two years, probably two and a half years to complete the whole project, but it is amazing. And you can imagine at the 150th level, if you have to take your pipes and windows and doors and, I mean, it has to be absolutely accurate. As you can see, the core and the wings, the core is going first and the wings follow that. And in this project, you, they, the, the structural engineer will not allow you to touch the walls, the core walls, because it's, it's so critical. So if you want to, if you've forgotten your sleeves, you just can't make any more sleeves. You, they, you don't even allow to put a nail inside the columns and beams. So, the coordination becomes very important. Uh, all the MEP services, everything you have to run through this whole building, and everything has to be pre-planned because there's absolutely no way you are allowed to drill holes or even put a nail in this building. Okay, let me come out because we have shortage of time. Okay, let me quickly go. So what do we do for executing this project? So first thing is the collaboration because you have so many design consultants, architects, owners, uh, so many contractors. So we have created a very important collaboration, the BIM execution plan. It was, it was very special because there is so many involvement, like we have to do the design, the design development, we have to do the, and you can imagine the millions of documents generated in this whole project. For three years, uh, we have been working on this, more than 100 people. So you can imagine the kind of documents. So we are using new forma here. Uh, so we, we, we integrate everything, there is a cloud, every document, every renaming, every plan is very well, have to be done for this type of project. Now design engineering. So you have to recheck all the pump head because the original concept design, now the requirement is changing. As the hotel uh, owners are getting finalized, the marketing team is changing the apartments, the layouts are changing, the usage is changing. So you have to now calculate everything fresh. So what we have done is from the Revit model, we have integrated with the various uh, design analysis software to do this particular design. So whether it's external static pressure, pump head, air. So, you know, we, for example, we are using Elite to calculate the ESP. Similarly for dialects, so now you have got a lighting requirement at every area in the corridors, in the rooms. So we use uh, the dialect software. Similarly, PipeNet, ETAP, and I know there are many softwares which you need to interface very intelligently with this. Now this is what, another thing that I would like to show you, this is very interesting. Today, we are talking of modularization. The way we do MEP services, the traditionally we have been hanging each services separately. Time has come when we combine all these services into one modules, one racks, and just hang them. Now, what are the advantages? I'll show you. There is a 10% reduction in the cost because of the economies of scale. 50 to 60% construction time reduction on the site. The productivity goes up. Now, what is modularization? Now, this is a traditional on-site fabrication. In one of the projects in US, you can see that outside there is a snow going on, and inside that building, it's a hospital project. So they've got pipes on the racks. They, they weld it on the site. And you know, if they cut any pipe, it is a waste. Whereas today we have to industrialize construction. We have to, you know, yesterday the term was used. We have to make assembly lines like cars and automobiles. We need to have assembly lines for creating our uh, MEP services for concrete for everything. So this is what we need to do. Let me show you. 
This is another very nice video. Just see this. This is the sheet metal for air conditioning which is being cut. Now from the BIM model, it directly goes to the CNC machine and it cuts it. And he, he, he's got uh, the, the scan codes, he's putting the, the scan code on that and so that on the site they can just use it. Now how many of you are general contractors, can you please raise your hand in this room? General contractors. MEP contractors, okay, they should be, uh, because this is really relevant, I don't know how much it is being used in Europe, but if you look at this, look at this sheet, it's just 2% wastage, so if I have a big sheet and if I can, you know from my model it is directly going to the, the CNC machine. There is no manual interface and the machine calculates, optimizes to, you know, from different ducts it will optimize to cut the sheet to reduce the wastage and everything is automated and you can see the end product, nothing left in that particular sheet. So when you are having this fabrication, see, traditionally this was done, the modular, you look at this, how it is being done. So you manufacture everything in your fab shop, take on the truckload, take it to the site and just put it inside. So it saves, when you are working on busy airports, when you're working on uh, you know, additions, renovations, uh, in the center of the city, this is the only option that is left because there is no space for work in the, in the city. Look at this, so everything is fabricated in your shop. So your site labor is much costlier. There are weather conditions, so you cannot do it always. But if you have done that in your shop, the quality is much better. The re Similarly, value engineering, when you come to BIM, we have to reduce cost. So if you look at the original design, uh, there was uh, 61 meters of cable tray that was used. We could reduce that to 24 meters by optimizing inside the BIM. So once you have everything on the 3D, you are able to find out better routing, the number of hangers goes down, the number of offsets goes down, so it is much easier. So these are the value engineering experiences. Now this is what we want, the construction management, the GPS based solutions. We have seen the site logistics, construction logistics, construction planning management, so we'll have the questions at the end. Uh, thank you, my time is up. I wish I had more time to show you various uh, case studies, but thank you very much for your patience. Just to wait for uh, Roberto Molinos Esparza, uh, which, uh, who is uh, the director of uh, uh, beam and automation and uh, virtual reality in uh, Modelical. Um, the, the main topics uh, Roberto will, deploy, will uh, develop in front of you is on top of this uh, extreme project, beam for innovation for beam, uh, innovated beam for uh, extreme project, here is more um, uh, a reflection and, and uh, some uh, big subject about what are the stages of innovation through BIM? And the, the, the main topics he, uh, he will develop for you is uh, uh, BIM as a framework for innovations and mean uh, on each stage of deploying BIM in a project, you should have uh, opportunities to, uh, to um, impact uh, the BIM with uh, some kind of innovations that we'll, uh, uh, Roberto will develop now. And uh, I will give you this the presentation. Hello, good morning. You give me coffee. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for being 
Sami for having me here. Thanks, Jean Paul, for the introduction. And my name is Roberto. I'm, I come from Madrid and Barcelona most of the times. And I work with a, a group of very talented people at Modelica. It's a small company. We do mostly BIM consultancy, BIM project development, and software development as well. I think you haven't heard anything of what I've been saying so far. Anyhow, so good morning again. So, um, may you live in interesting times. It's one of the best things you can see anyone, but it used to be a curse, una maldición, right? Live in interesting times because uh, our times are always full of problems, right? Times full of problems. Who doesn't have a problem? Uh, Bimal was saying that construction is uh, under stress. I think we've always lived in stress, and we always think that we're living in the worst of the times, the most complex of the times. And us, most of us, we, we love, or we have to solve problems, and that's why we have to innovate. And the issue is that we have to solve problems all over the world. Now, if you're a contractor, if you are an architect, if you are an engineer, you're likely to be working next door, but you're also likely to be working in Qatar, in Panama, in Colombia. So you have to compete with people all over the world. So it's not, it's not easy, right? So we are saying we innovate because we need to solve problems. We need to apply our knowledge, our skills to solve new problems. Let's have a quick look on what kind of problems we, we like solving. If we were to create a, this kind of a axis, we could split our problems into four main categories. This is not mine. This has been along, around for uh, 10 years. It's a model from uh, DeLong and in, in Harvard, from Harvard, right? So you could think about problems being commodities, right? Like solving a, a common and simple is, issue, make me a house or maybe 100 houses. You could be thinking about procedure problems where you have to select among uh, uh, different options for an implementation, right? You have to select among, you have to choose, make choices, right? Then you could have gray hair problems, where expertise, experience is, it, it has strong, a strong weight on it. And then on the, far, on the far right, we will have rocket science problems, right? Problems where the client has no idea what it wants, very hard to tackle, okay? The, the value we are providing in, in such different cases is different, right? It changes. We could have a... We need to be efficient if we want to, be, if we want to solve commodity problems. We need, to be, uh, we need to apply experience if we're going to go for the middle. And we, want to have, we, have, we need to have expertise if we want to do rockets. And the different skills you need to follow on your, on your organization are going to be different as well. Right? You, you, if, you wanna be, uh, if you want to have to be efficient, you have to have the right tools, the right processes. You have to have the right knowledge management strategy. You have to be up to state of the art technology and so forth, right? And if you look at the bottom line, at the bottom, at the bottom, the bottom row, most of, many of those words there are very related to BIM, right? Very, very, very connected to BIM. You could, you could speak about all of those without leaving the BIM, co the BIM context. So let me throw a question at you at this, uh, at this time in the morning. Where are you, right? The things you do, are you solving commodity problems? Are you solving gray hair problems? Are you solving rocket science problems? Right? If we were to make a survey here, based on your self-assessment, this is what we get. None of you is going to say it's doing commodity problem. You know what a commodity is, right? A commodity, a commodity is something you will, uh, it's like water, right? You will, open the, you will open the tap, water will follow. You don't, you don't actually go on tender. You don't, you don't ask where the, the water comes from. You're not asking for uh, its beam implementation plan, right? You just open the water tap and it comes. It's a commodity. It's like when you ask for modelers to be sourced to your company or you're asking for, a, mo you're asking for a, uh, a model itself, right? It starts, it's starting to become a commodity. Right? So if we were to do a self-report here, this is what we get. No worries, it's okay. But if we look from an empirical point of view, if, if someone, we get some judges here looking at what we actually do, including all of us, this is what we get, right? We're most likely, been doing, we're most likely doing commodity work, right? Something that is not adding too much value to our clients to the project we're doing. And that's okay, because that's the market, the market drift. You have to compete, you have to compete, you have to go, you have to lower your prices, you have to lower your standards if you wanna, if you wanna make a living out of this. It's a market, right? For good or for bad. So how do we get ourselves back to the right, back to where we want to be? Well, of course, innovation is one, one of the things that would make that. But there are other ones, right? We could say, we could get skilled people we could buy skilled companies, or we could say no to commodity work. 
You could say, no, and say, I don't want to do this. I want to focus on my rockets. I want to focus on my highly expertise, uh, high-paying work. But at the end of the month, you have to, pay the, you have to go, do the payroll, you have to pay the bills, right? So sometimes it's, it's hard to say no to commodity work. Let's now look also at the value all this brings to the client, right? Because there are things you can do that will bring value internally, and there are things you can do that will bring value to the client. When you're doing commodity work, the client is not very worried. It's just taking for granted you will do the work. So innovation there doesn't pay very well to the client, right? It pays well internally. If you're going to innovate, the innovation when you're doing community work has to be for yourself. Otherwise, you're doing it wrong because somebody else will come, will, will underprice you, you will, get, you will not get the commission, right? So innovation when you're doing community work has to be for yourself. But of course, when you're doing rock and science, the innovation goes to solving a big client's problem, right? Besides that, you could just provide your client with insights. So when you are not only solving the problem, but you are making them learn something new, with, based on your experience, based on the things you can do, right? you are adding value to the client. And of course, there's always the marketing, right? I used to think marketing is a perverse thing, but it's true, you need marketing. You need to spread the message, tell everyone, hey, hey this is what we're doing, this is, this, we're cool, right? You want to work with us. That works well the further you go to the right, because you also have to, to explain better what you're doing. When you're doing commodity work, you don't, have to, you don't need to advertise. It's not that important, right? Or it's hard to improve the message on top of that. All right. Uh, so my, my key point here is that BIM, as what you, know what you know what BIM is, right? I see it as a huge innovation opportunity, not only in the, in the sense of being able to do things differently as a, as a practice or as a, as a sector, but also to provide new solutions to our clients. Let me give you some samples, right? Let's have a look at five samples, five levels of uh, things we're actually doing at the, at the office, um, and how they relate with what you want to do. For instance, we're going to start with automation at the, at the bottom left. If we have to compete with, with companies, if I, my company is 20 people, right? If I have to compete with the company of BMAL, right? I cannot staff myself to that, that level. I, I cannot go that way because salaries are different. Uh, the regulation here is different, right? So my only option to move myself back to the right is to be more efficient, is to make less mistakes, is to be much, much faster. So fast that not even with 100 or 1,000 people you could follow me, because that has, a, that has an overhead, right? So you have to, we will, you should focus on automation, right? Automating things just to drive you from the left to the right. If you, then we could, we could speak about collaboration, which is going to have a huge effect on all types of work. Well, I'll go through this, right? but basically we are, I'm going to be focusing on five different areas where value is added or the yeah, application is uh, different on these on this different four uh, types of work. Let's think, start with automation. This is one project we did. We started almost three, three years ago. It's the Al Hor Stadium in, in northern Qatar. It's one of the seven, seven uh, venues for uh, FIFA 2022. It's a project we did, uh, we did with a partner in, 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 in Qatar as well, and we were actually commissioned to build on top of the, on top of the uh, uh, detailed design, CAD drawings. We were able to do a, a pre-construction model for just finding clashes and ensuring everything was, was fine. Right? I'm not going to just bo bo uh, bore you, but we basically applied many different ways of automation. For instance, we, we, were, we, would, we would go to Navisworks look for clashes, and instead of producing this massive report, I don't know if you've, had, uh, if you've been lucky enough to go through one of these reports, class reports, instead of ha doing that, we would just basically take or mark the items back into Revit automatically. So you, you could apply a filter, you could apply special views and see which elements were directly uh, under an issue, right? We, we would also use spreadsheets to assign finishes to different rooms. And based on that, we will, we will model the finishes on, on each one of the 2,000 rooms in the project automatically. Of course, that doesn't solve 100% of the problem, but we would solve 80% of the problem. So you need less people to do it, right? And you are, be, you are making less mistakes. But what this would do is it, it will read the, a room's perimeter, and then it will, it will uh, read an Excel spreadsheet and will just apply the walls, the thin walls for the, for the finishes. That will be the result, okay? 
Then we, we started working in another project. This was uh, almost one year ago. Uh, this is an airport. This is public. I cannot speak much because this is still under confidentiality agreements, but this is public, so you can see this, of course. And in, in this project, we, again, applied a lot of automation. We basically were able to model hundreds and, and uh, sorry, thousands of panels, thousands of roof lights, not even, by, not even touching any of them, just applying computational techniques, right? We would just move from between different tools, we would use Rabbit, uh, Grasshopper, something called Flax, and we would use Excel, we would use AutoCAD, we would use many things just to drive the information in the best way possible that could, would spare us from e modeling anything by hand. If I give you a, a quick summary of this, right? Something we did in 2014, it would take us six, six months to produce that model. Of course, it was more detailed, it had all the MEP on it, right? And I'm giving you some, some insights there, right? We, we, were able to, we were able to model uh, almost three gigabytes of Revit files, clean Revit files. But the most important metrics for us are those 8,000 8, warnings and six months of work. We were not good enough at that time, right? We would make a lousy model. It was not very good. But we, next time we had a big commission, because uh, this airport is 1, 000, 1 million square meters, and we were commissioned to make an LOD 200 model in four weeks, right? And that's what we did, seven people, we did it. And um, we actually focus a lot on performance, on the way we would, on creating not only a big model, good looking model, but also a usable model. That model has, is now being used by more than 50 people which are producing the, the detailed design. Well, just how do we get there, right? How will we be able to do this kind of work in four weeks? Not doing it manually, right? Not doing it not, actually, not trying not to do it. We just applied automation on it. Another project, which is also very famous around, many companies working here. We were, here we were able, uh, we were lucky enough to work with uh, several Spanish companies, and in this case, something we did for uh, Center. We have some good friends with Center here with us today. We were commissioned or asked to model 6.5 kilometers of cladding in uh, less than a month. Actually, they, they were like, I mean, Revit is not, is not good for this, right? It's not. Actually, the guy who, who decided to do this in Revit and the guy who decided to design, to design the, the metro like that are not the same guy, of course, obviously. But by mixing different tools, by, mixing, by using information in the right way, we were able to produce all the cladding, or at least a preliminary version of the cladding, in two days. Right? It would have taken us, I don't know, months to do it by hand. But, so that's why we, we, we didn't try it. You can see that's Other things we do is uh, we will apply uh, a lot of uh, thought on, on coordination. Here we are just applying, it's a, what you see is a workflow, we are, we've been applying on the uh, Santiago Chile airport. We, we, we will just try to avoid our uh, coordination manually. We'll just create or find clashes between structural elements, uh, structural uh, walls and, and slabs and MEP elements and just place dampers, place leaves automatically. You can remember uh, Bima's image on, on, on just marking the cat on the, on the wall, which is actually what we're doing in BIM. That is actually a coordination model, because you can exchange that model with the MEP engineer and the structural engineer. So both can speak on top of that third coordination model. And since it, each object has its own ID, has its own properties, you can, you can assign them, you can review them independently. So that's also another, that's another way of applying aut uh, automation to improve right, certain workflows. You can see there the foundations of the airport. Next topic I think we need to focus on, 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 on innovation, it's collaboration, right? I think we have to stop speaking about uh, repositories and strategies and stuff, and we, have, we should look to other, uh, to other industries. For instance, the software industry. If, if software engineers were to produce software in the same way we produce models, we would be lost, right? That's because they don't worry that much about the tools they use for collaboration, because the tools, the tools take care of the collaboration itself. They, it's made more transparent. We've been trying to focus on uh, change management and, 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 and comparison of different models in several projects we've been doing with, uh, with Sathir on construction, construction stage. And basically, we, we came up with a process where you would just be able to always track the, the changes among, uh, along the project and be able to make comparison between two steps of the project. It's very important because, we, because when change, changes happen in, in BIM, you have to look for them. You, have, you can mark them up somehow, but it's, hard, it's still a hard task. 
And I don't, I don't see any of that in, in, in PAS 1192, how do you manage changes properly, right? This is what we need. It's very lousy, but it's, just a, it's a code, compar uh, code comparison tool, right? You will just get the original code, the new code, and the tool will tell you where are the differences. It will not tell you if it works or not, it will, but it will spot the differences for you. Do we have this for BIM? Not very clear, right? So that's another space for innovation. There are algorithms, there are tools out there that are already trying to tackle this. For instance, Construe, it's one tool coming out of a the engineering firm, Thornton Tomasetti, actually trying to tackle that, solve that for the, for the, for the uh, structural design part. Third area of innovation is just, what happens if I put all the information that describes a building available to everyone or available for other purposes? For instance, uh, uh, Fernando gave us a, a great lecture yesterday, but this is basically the same. Let me just... Yeah, yeah. I'm running, right. right. So you could, get, you could think about the information described in this building as a service. In the same way, your Facebook feed is a service, can be, can be used by other, by, by other tools, right? So the idea behind this is that information describing the built environment could be mixed with other areas. And who's going to do that? Software engineers? Why don't we do it, right? We are the ones who are expert in the built environment. Also, business insights. This is something we did with, for, a, for a client, uh, which is uh, actually about to build a stadium. And actually, he was asking, well, I don't need a very detailed MEP model, as built MEP model. What I need to know is if I, break, if I remove this pipe, which spaces am I going to render are useful, right? So that's what we did. We, we modified somehow Revit. So if you notice this, if I remove this pipe, I have, I'm serving three fixtures. So I will be killing those three rooms, right? So you, you are able now to do that with the model with just a tiny, tiny programming on top. That's a business insight, because you can decide, you can make business decisions based on that. Speaking about stadiums, when you have 100,000 seats on a, on a project, on a stadium, you can do pretty good uh, silent analysis. This is something we did for Alhor Stadium, Khalifa Stadium in, in Doha. We're also doing it in other stadiums currently. Or you can, you can uh, actually start playing with information in a different way. You can offer your client ways of using those models in a more, let's say, more appealing or, more, or, or, a, or in a way which is closer to the, to the daily business. Here you have a cam no. This is something we, we've, been developing, uh, we've been doing for Barca in the last, the last months. And you know the mosaics? You know how they make the mosaics pre, uh, before a, a match, right? They have a guy just painting colors on an AutoCAD drawing, which it could be this way, right? You could just, if you have a model, you could stamp in on it, and then you can, you can source that to the uh, marketing guys or to the ticketing guys and just assign the, 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 the board colors directly, right? That's something you can do with a model. And who's, who's going to invent that? A marketing guy? Why don't we do it, right? Right. And just to, to, to finalize, uh, next thing, and this is where we are now, it's when you start getting structured information about your built environment, where you can analyze thousands of stores, thousands of uh, uh, branches, thousands of locations. Could you start getting insights out of that and automate design, right? We, we're starting to see that in some areas, like the, the grid, it's, a, it's an uh, artificial intelligence empower um, web-based or web, web, de uh, web design suite, right? Are we going to see that on, on architecture and engineering? Well, we are, it seems so, right? So who's going to invent that? Yes, so to f yes, this, is my, this is my last, last slide. And think about where you want to be on the spectrum here. And think about if you want to make innovation for yourself, just to be more efficient and make, uh, spend less money, right? Or you think if you want to produce new services, go and speak with your client in, in their terms and fix their, their problems or start to fix problems they don't really know they have, right? And I think BIM, it's a great opportunity to do so. We have, we have the tools, we have the, it's a framework, uh, it's inexpensive compared to actually building robots, something like that. And I, I, I don't know why we, why we wouldn't do that, right? So may you live in interesting times, and, and thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, both of you, uh, Roberto and Bilmal. Um, we should have a session of questions, but it's very short time. Yeah. So, uh, Sorry.
Questions, questions. Questions? So, only one question for Roberto, only one question for Bilal. Bimal. Anyone? No. And they have this one, this one out there. Ah, okay. Where? Behind the camera. Behind the camera. Ah, okay. Please. Hola, buenos días. Uh, ah, we don't hear you. Hola. Buenos días. Good morning. I was really impressed on how you use different tools to uh, make your work going faster. And I wanted to ask you, based on my experience, every time we change the software, we change at least 20% of the information from the previous uh, software program. So how were you able to solve these problems? I will answer in Spanish. To us, the secret is not thinking in documentation, not thinking in documents, in models. We like to think in moving information, taking information that you want. And almost all problems nowadays allow to extract the information in a systematic way so that you can use them in another software program. So we don't really use exchange files. We use uh, APIs, application program interface, so we can extract information and take that to another software program, and this way we don't miss any information. Question for Bimal? I, I have one. <laughs> I have one. Um, my question would be about the, the, uh, the relation between the two presentations, how you can connect community and uh, with the, the rocket science because in fact you you need a, a kind of labs a kind of research parts of in your company to solve problem on the field uh, how did that works together Jean I think it's a it's a very good question because we complement each other yeah. what Roberto is doing he's trying to automate find api's find how to speed up the process mm -hmm. and as he said probably 80% of the things can be done by automation, but the finishing, the rest of the 20% where you really need the human intelligence, uh, you need the value engineering that I was talking about. So I think there is a, in, in our organization, for example, we have a team of, uh, we call it center of excellence where they develop these applications and what Roberto is doing to speed up our process. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we both can, you know, uh, to the industry, to the beam construction industry, uh, both of us are equally important to take us to the next orbit in the beam industry. Yeah, thank you very much, both of you. I think uh, the new the new eye of beam is innovation. That's co mm -hmm. that's correct. That's going to be okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.